Also, online. HPG connection, online. Educational module, online. All systems, nominal. Hello, class, and welcome to On the Origin of Battlemex podcast, episode 79. I'm your host, Brent Stewart. My co-hosts today are... I'm Joshua. And I'm Chandler. And today we are talking about the Clint, a 40-ton machine. Also known as Cheapest Bitter. Also known as you don't need to have a great mech to stomp on tanks. It's true, you just need legs. So the Clint is a case example of a machine built with cost-cutting measures, and ironically, almost all of the historical records were lost, so it is difficult for us to understand why each corner was cut. We do know the major issue is the stress wear on the chassis and parts. They were able to produce over 200 units, with many variants before Andorian Industries Limited on Bell was destroyed during the fall of the Star League. They were able to secure the contract with the SLDF by having the Clint be cheap. They recouped their costs by using non-standard parts and selling the SLDF the extended service plan for the machines. The Clint has many variants, but due to the loss of the records, it is impossible to know if the variant is a field refit or a factory model. The Clint has seen an increase in numbers with the factory on Bell being rebuilt, and then the plans being secured by Defiance Industries. The Clint 2, after the events that resulted with the Clan Wolverine being annihilated and the destruction of the Snow Raven capital, Dehera Dun, they rebuilt using the Clint's taken from the SLDF Brian caches. The tech and scientist casts were able to swap out the old engine for a locally produced model that was lighter but was able to maintain the speed the Clint was used to. They used the spare tonnage to reinforce the, stru the structure, eliminating the problems, added armor, and ammunition. So the Clint has the design quirks of improved targeting, medium and long, exposed actuators, difficult to maintain, and non-standard parts. The Clint 2C has improved targeting, medium and long. The first model today we have is the CLNT-1-2R, seen in 2607. This guy has a movement profile of 69, a medium laser, and an AC-10. It's got 10 single heat sinks and standard engine, no weight savings, and one ton of ammo in the right torso. I, I find the background fluff for why this mech was produced more interesting than the mech itself. Yeah, that's legit. <laughs> in part because the original design comes from the Star League Armaments Act of 2507 to produce inexpensive mechs to patrol and garrison outlying territories. Mm -hmm. The 1-2-R with the AC-10, yeah, it's... There weren't a lot of them. There were it's only a, 10 of them, but yeah. Yeah, this is definitely the first model. Uh, they ended up switching out the AC-10 for something lighter to help alleviate some of the stress issues. Not fix, alleviate. I mean, it packs a nice punch for a 40-tonner, and 6.9 is a pretty good speed for a 40-tonner. Mm -hmm. Not 100% that it's optimal, but should be close on a standard fusion engine. Mm-hmm. So this is basically the prototype without the prototype uh, or primitive equipment. You won't yes. see a lot of these, but it's uh, interesting to bring up and see that this is a theoretical option. It has a battle value of 707 and a point value of 19. It's a small centurion. Yeah. If they'd bumped it up by five tons to a 45 tonner, they would have given themselves an extra ton and a half for equipment. Mm -hmm. So next up, we have the 2-3T seen in 2608. This model moves at a speed of 696. It's got a medium laser in the center torso, a medium laser in the left torso, and an AC-5 in the right arm. It's got one ton of ammo in the right torso for the AC-5 and 10 single heat sinks. This is the classic Clint. Yep. Again, 45 tons would have given it an extra ton and a half to play with, but... It's fairly fairly standard 40-ton medium mech, kind of light on the armor, but... Yeah. I mean, when you're just defending against Toyota Helix in space, you don't need a ton of armor. You just need, you know, to withstand that first hit and then to shoot them. Mm -hmm. Or move fast enough to not get hit. Yes. I mean, I'm sure the pirates' uh, tracking systems are absolutely top-notch, state-of-the-art, you, you know, not usually just the Mark One eyeball, right? <laughs> yeah. Well, it's also... I don't know, man. <laughs> it's also fun to think that 
they got them on a service contract. Like Andorin Tech with these first clints is basically Apple. Oh yeah, here's your relatively cheap, but you have to come to us to service it. Mm-hmm. Don't you dare take it to a third party repair place. They call all the pilots on a regular basis to talk about their uh, mech's extended warranty. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and there weren't a lot built before Andorin was destroyed in the fall of the Star League, so hmm. don't see that it was particularly common, I would think, given there are only 300 built by the end of the Star League. Yeah, but that's of this particular model. Yeah, the 2 3T. Mm-hmm. So this guy's got a battle value of 770 and a point value of 21. A little bit of a bump from the previous one, but uh, not a, a leap and bound, right? <laughs> Yeah. So next up, we have the 2-4T, and we don't have a hard date on it, but we believe it was made in 2610. Yeah, according to the research Chandler did into Megamech, Megamech claims 2610. Um, I dug into the original TRO 3025 entry for the Clint, and it has a twin autocannon variant reported on Rondell around the, the first succession war. So closest I could pin it down to is around the late 2790s um, as the only officially seen, um, oh, the only the only time this variant has officially been seen. So mm-hmm. 2610 to 2790 is kind of the range we, we've been able to narrow it down to. Yeah, so this guy's got a movement profile of 6'9". It's got a medium laser in the center torso and two AC2s in the right arm. It's got one ton of ammo for that in the right torso, as is tradition. Uh, but, you know, with the AC2 it's got 45 shots, so that's a that'll do you for a game of uh, Battletech. It's got 10 single heat sinks, and uh, yeah, ra- rather plain on the inside still. But uh, I look at this one and I feel like bargain bin blackjack. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, it feels like it's a recon mech like it was originally designed to be, but it also can harass a lot better with the AC2s because it can just stay way out of range and just be like, yeah, you can't touch me. And I might only be throwing a small rock at you, but eventually this rock's going to hit something important. Mm-hmm. Well, and it's interesting. Um, it doesn't look like the newer... TROs mention it, but the original TRO talks about how good the Clint's targeting computer is and um, what a difference that makes. So I'm, if, it, if you're looking at the original TRO, it should have some sort of targeting quirk, which would make those AC2s even more accurate and scary. It does have improved targeting at medium and long range. Okay. It just doesn't have like a computer or anything for it. Yeah, it doesn't they have an actual they, targeting computer. Yeah, they haven't quantified it with equipment. It's just like the inbuilt one's real good, <laughs> which I'm I'm fine with. I just wish they would print the quirks and on their the text sheet. on the record sheet. Yeah, I mean maybe not text because that could get a little large with certain machines that have like six to eight quirks, but at the very least a reminder that they are there. You know. Yeah, and I think I think most text could be rewarded to a single line. And if you put them on the record sheet, you can make them cost BV. Some of the newer ones will have them, the record sheet, which is nice. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I have seen it's it. It's just in a, a word, places. though, not like a. doesn't actually explain it, but the new me- Battle Mech Manual has them all listed in it. So usually, if you need to figure out what it is, you can easily find it. Mm-hmm. So this guy has a BV of 619 and a point value of 16. And uh, I, I actually really like this Clint. I think this one's got a lot of potential. Although it might just be because I've been playing a bunch of MechWarrior 5 and uh, I have a newfound respect for AC2. Yeah, just another example of why we need a, a rewritten rules to make the tabletop match everything else more closely. AC2 go burr. Daka, daka, daka. So next up we have the Clint 2C going into Clan Space in 2842. This guy's got a movement profile of 696. It's got an ER medium laser in the center torso and one in the left torso, and it has an LB-10XAC in the right arm. It's got four tons of ammo, so two slug and two cluster. It has endo steel, an XL engine, and ten single heat sinks. They're still using single heat sinks. Well, I guess it's autocannon armed, so... Mm-hmm. 
I mean, if you fire both your ER medium lasers, you will and move, you will generate the movement heat, which is not terrible, but it's not amazing. I mean, for something that's supposed to just be like third line, essentially, uh, it does the job. Mm -hmm. And, I mean, 2830s is very early on into the clan era. Like, if this was designed another 200 years after, I'm sure it would have just had double heat sinks because at that point they were just like, why not? Mm -hmm. Well, also, this was uh, a re retrofit and then a uh, production model for Clan Snow Raven after the capital was destroyed uh, during the Clan Wolverine Annihilation, which was very early in uh, Clan history because Nicholas was still alive. <laughs> and it was all Nicholas's fault. It was. I blame the Widowmakers, personally. I mean, why did they have to make the sacrificial lamb, like, so likable? Because, like, let's be real, the Clan Wolverine, you, you read about them and you're like, I like these people. <laughs> I mean, that's the whole point. You, you know? I know, I know. <laughs> a, a, sacrif a sacrifice isn't a sacrifice if you want it dead. Yeah. I Reading that book, I, you know, I blame Nicholas to an extent, but at the same time, that dang Widowmaker con, like, he he's the reason everything went bad. This whole thing probably would have just gone smoothed over if he wasn't there constantly stirring the pot and going, yeah, but the Wolverines, sire. <laughs> well, but Nicholas you know, knew exactly what he was plotting doing. against them. Nicholas knew what he was up to the whole time, and he straight up told the uh, Wolverine Con that, yeah, he was doing this because his dream needed a boogeyman to mm -hmm. shape all of the other clans uh, around. Yeah, but the Widowmaker definitely escalated it unnecessarily. <laughs> Again, I think they escalated it, but they were still just the cat's paw, like... Oh, yeah, like Krensky, it was a one-two punch is what I'm saying. Krens Krensky needed them to do that, so he let them get away with it. Like, mm -hmm. If he had wanted, he could have stepped in and and stopped Stop that. Them. Oh, yeah. But, you know, he, that, that con was allowed to meddle with things because that's what Kerensky wanted, because Kerensky's a crazy... I mean, the way I would describe it is that uh, Kerensky, it was Kerensky's plan, but his attack dog which is the Widowmakers, kind of got off the leash and got away from him a little bit you know made things that much worse yeah ironic that he would eventually die by a Widowmaker con's hand or fitting without the Widowmaker con there to push as hard and fast as he did clan wolverine might not have seen it coming and not have been able to get any survivors out because he possibly his pushing really kind of tipped tipped his hand to the fact that wolverines were going to be sacrificed to make a point mm -hmm. so the other thing about this machine is it gets new art and much more of a action pose which is uh kind of cool definitely running down the field uh looks like it's scouting because it's got its head articulated off to its left i uh, i like this art it's real cool but i look at the head and i think it's related to the falcon because of the ears mm -hmm. you know <laughs> <laughs> it's always nice to see a rotating head in battle mech art just a reminder mm -hmm. that that's actually a thing Mm -hmm. So this guy's got a battle value of thirteen ninety five and a point value of twenty five, and uh, you know it's clan tech. Can't can't go wrong with clan tech. Uh, oh, also it has case, of course, because it is clan tech. And four tons of AC ten ammo or LB ten mm -hmm. X ammo. So mm -hmm. mix and match to your heart's content. Yeah. So next up we have the two dash three T Denton, our first named model, seen in thirty thirty three. This guy's got a movement profile of six nine six. It's got a medium laser in the center torso, a medium laser in the left torso, and a large laser in the right arm. It's got fourteen heat sinks, and that's about it. Swapping your AC5 for a large laser and four heat sinks. Yeah, it's not a bad trade up. Mm -hmm. No, I, I like this one. You know, uh, making it completely ammo independent. Uh, you know, it'd be sweet if we could upgrade them to doubles, but uh, not quite there on the tech level. A couple years away, getting those back if effectively everywhere but uh no this is this is pretty sweet and i think uh a version two would have a lot of promise yeah and if you actually you're only building movement heat unless you jump well i mean i guess jumping is movement mm -hmm. so that's yeah pretty solid configuration you probably be a really good you know uh jungle fighter extended deployment harasser still boring yeah but we can put it somewhere interesting <laughs> yeah. is that fair <laughs> <laughs> If we take the boring and take it out of the boring and put it into the interesting, is it still boring? You can take the boring out of the boring, but you can't. Yeah, whatever. All right. <laughs> so it's got a battle value 
So it's got a battle value of 873 and a point value of 20. We then come to the 2-3-U in 3050, and this guy, again, has some different art. A more action-y pose than the classic, but not as uh, action-y as the 2-C. It's, you know, he's going for a jaunty walk. He's got a movement profile of 696. He's got a medium pulse laser in the center torso and a medium pulse laser in the left torso. It's got a ER PPC in the right arm. It has 10 double heat sinks, and that's about it. Yeah. Now I want an ER light PPC. Hmm. I mean, they'll come eventually. A light snub PPC. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we have a heavy PPC, right? So naturally, you have the normal, and then you have the light. Heavy snub PPC. Maybe you got some room for a medium, because, you know, we have the light, medium, heavy, and then assault. <laughs> assault uh, PPC. Uh, heavy snub it's like PPC. The plasmas from, uh, it's like the plasma PPCs from uh, Mech Assault 2. Yeah. Of course, snub PPC with a capacitor. I need to play with those. <laughs> But the uh, ERPPC on the right arm of this guy is pretty sweet. You know, not too sure about the the heat on that one, you know, compared to other things. And uh, the medium pulse lasers, it's a uh, little, little sad to lose some range there, but not a lot that can be done about that. Yeah, it definitely becomes more of a, a bracket fighter, mm -hmm. even though technically that ERPPC has no minimum range. It's just so hot that, generally speaking, you won't want to shoot it at point-blank ranges. Or at least take a turn off each time. Yeah, because it does get toasty. It's not... Yeah, it does get toasty, because you're talking 8 heat between the medium pulse lasers and then 15 mm -hmm. heat. So, 23 heat before movement, and you've got 20 heat sinks, so... If you're jumping, oh boy, that's going to get hot. Yeah. Yeah, this is the first client I actually interacted with through HBS Battletech, one of the mods. Uh, the 3062, I ended up starting with one of these, effectively. It was my workhorse for a while, because it was like, oh, I need that mech dead. I'll just point you at it, and, you know, it'll figure it out eventually. <laughs> <laughs> and then the and then the ERPPC got shot off, and then I was like, oh, well, this is uh, not nearly as fun anymore. Um, I haven't used the term in a while, but I think... This is a mech that I would definitely classify as a trooper mech. It's oh, yeah. very simple, very straightforward, very boring. You just here it is. Go do your click adventure your thing. We can put a lot of put a lot of you out there. You can be the rank and file of of battle mechs. Mm -hmm. Although ironically, not supported by the fluff. Well, I mean, the fluff does say they can be found pretty much anywhere. True, but you know, the the trooper is like isn't one of the categories that it has to be able to be easily maintained and is, you know... That is fair. Although, yeah. I is don't... Is this in <laughs> the original The original factory was destroyed, uh, so why are all of these new mechs still using non-standard, hard-to-maintain parts if we've got completely new factories? Why didn't you just tool up to, to make better parts? I, I, I would ask because the same they question to the board the of directors. <laughs> They realize that the success of the Clint is not in its being a good mech. It is in uh, them calling about their mech's extended warranty. That is the success. <laughs> yes. You're not buying a mech. You're buying a service plan. Yep. It's like buying a Ford. Buy the Clint. It's a live service. <laughs> <laughs> I only do live service if it's free to play. Out of season April Fool's joke. Yeah. <laughs> So this guy's got a battle value of uh, 1,081 and a point value of 22. We then come to the 5U seen in 3062. It's got a movement profile of 696. It's got an ER medium laser in the center torso, as well as a tag. It has a C3 slave in the left torso, as well as two ER medium lasers, and then a ER large laser in the right arm. So kind of the upgrade of that uh, Denton. It's got 12 double heat sinks, and it has endo steel and a light engine. Finally, a Clint that's actually interesting. Mm -hmm. And boy, did it get interesting fast. <laughs> this one actually lives up to the whole scouting idea, or heavy recon, or well, medium recon that the Clint's supposed to have. This this one actually feels like that. Mm -hmm. Like, you can engage some light to medium mechs with this and still deal out some data with the C3, and you can still tag for artillery. Like, this thing can do a little bit of everything. This is your trooper, just a little scouting edition. 
Yeah, no, it's is... your special ops trooper. Yeah, your recon <laughs> trooper. And players rejoice. It's available to mercenaries from the immediate introduction of it. And by the time the jihad is over, looks like the Lyrans are selling it to just about everybody to the point where by the end of the Republic Sphere era and the Dark Ages, it is a general mech for the Inner Sphere and the Periphery. So in the Il-Clan era, if you want and this the mech... the Periphery, wow. Yeah, if you're an Il-Clan player, you can feel this mech. There's just You can feel it. It's everywhere. Everybody makes it. Everybody uses it. Mm-hmm. Little do we know, the Steiners have survived off of the money from this. It is the yeah. reason they still exist. That was the real reason Melvina Hazen attacked Tharkat. She was tired of getting contacted by a, about her Clint's extended warranty. <laughs> yeah, she got one. She got one for the Jade Falcons once, just to see how it was, and then they just never stopped calling. Even through the blackout, <laughs> they found an HPG close by. <laughs> I do really like the C three slave in this one. I think I think that really elevates this machine. Yeah, between the ER large and the tag. That C3 slave gives you a lot of interesting options. Because mm-hmm. now your tagger, your your spotter, doesn't have to have tag because they can just get close C3 back to this Clint, and this Clint can tag off of that C3. Because mm-hmm. the tag has a range of 15, but you know normally you're not going to get a lot of hits at 15. Yeah, but now you can you can be sitting back sniping with your ER large and tagging things and count as your short range bracket even out to 15 hexes as long as you have a spotter so it's spicy now are we getting a, a good plastic time. one of these no i don't believe so not yet anyway bummer mm-hmm. all right uncheck mark <laughs> it'd be good for a jihad or well actually let's let's back up this is a like came off the presses right as fedcom civil war started so for a fedcom uh what is it kickstarter this would be a decent mech actually to choose as a random medium to throw in there because almost mm-hmm. everyone uses it it it's different and it doesn't have a recent model boom there you go so it's got a battle value of 1275 and a point value of 28 we then come to the 2-3 ul seen in 3069 back to the uh, double dashes Dash dash. It's got a movement profile of 696. It has an ER medium laser in the center torso and an ER medium laser in the left torso. And then it has a plasma rifle in the right arm. It has 10 double heat sinks and 3 tons of ammo for that plasma rifle in the right torso. So I like this one. This is cool. I mean, I haven't had a chance to play with this model, but I look at it and I'm like, this is a good way to test out a plasma rifle, I think. Also, should be pointed out that this one finally has standardized equipment and is approved by the certification board. That's why it has that UL rating. Ah. Little joke for all the electricians out there. Yeah. Um, oh, what was I going to say? This, I like this. This is fun. I like plasma rifle. Plasma rifle, good. I'm, I'm very surprised that, is... that this one has no overheat value while the 5U does have an overheat value, because this has 20 double heat sinks and 20 weapon heat. So when each of them alpha strike, they would be only generating movement heat. Yes. Well, the 5U has... um, Oh, never mind. It has three ER mediums. I missed the third ER medium. Yeah, the two. Right, yes, yes. So Yeah, I I thought the other one only had two ER mediums. I was like, oh, it should be heat, almost heat neutral. No, no, that's not the case. Never mind. I can fix it in editing if you want. <laughs> no, that's no big deal. All right. Yeah, a, a plasma rifle test bed or trial, not a bad way to use this. Mm-hmm. Uh, but again, it kind of goes back to um, boring. I mean, I find plasma rifles exciting, so. Uh, yes, but they're one of those things where it's like, it's so good, and that's what makes it exciting, that it's kind of like, okay, we got a plasma rifle, yeah, it's really good. It's, like, it's just good, it's not flashy. Yeah. Yeah, fair. And it's one I, trick. I mean, I mean, I haven't had a chance to play with one on the tabletop yet, but I imagine getting that extra roll for the heat damage would, you know, like be a lot of fun and tension, you know. I also find it interesting that uh, when it comes out, it's Capellan Confederation and Torian, and then adds in the Magistracy of Canopus, and then the Capellans stop producing it in the Dark Ages. Hmm, so it's basically <laughs> only found in the periphery now. 
Nifty. The periphery. Back to the periphery with you. This guy's got a battle value of 1245 and a point value of 20. And uh, I think it's pretty sweet. So we then come to the 3-3T scene in 3069. It's got a movement profile of 696. It has a medium laser in the center torso, a medium laser in the left torso, and a, sorry, LAC? Light auto cannon. Light auto cannon, okay. Yeah, no, I don't think I've actually seen one written out on a record sheet before. Yeah, so a light auto cannon 5, and it has pharaoh for some weight savings, and it has two tons of ammo as well as case. So this is the... And uh, 10 single heat sinks. I actually like this one better than the plasma one. I think it's a little more interesting because it finally has more armor than structure. I believe this mm-hmm. is the first Clint to do that. <laughs> Fair. Mm-hmm. This, this, this is a light armored boy. In alpha strike terms. Your, your 5U. Oh, your 5U has a lot of armor. Okay, that's mm-hmm. fair, but it also has well, an XL. Relatively speaking. Yeah, or light. So, no, it, yes. it has a light, yeah. They both have XLs. No, the 5U I, has no, a light. I'm getting confused between them. Okay, the 5U has a light fusion engine and endo steel, and then the 3, 3T has Pharaoh. A fusion Fair, okay, yeah. and Pharaoh. Sorry, yeah. I, was, I, was looking at the, I was looking at I was looking ahead at the 6S. That's why I thought we had an XL on this. Yeah, so I like the fact that it's the most survivable Clint, in Alpha Strike terms at least. That light auto cannon is interesting because now you can play around with special munitions. Since you have two tons, you can carry one ton of standard AC5 ammo and then like one ton of precision or one ton of flak. A lot of things you can do there. And of course, it's an AC5, so each ton gets you a lot of shots. Even with the halved shots for precision, you're still going to have plenty of shots with precision. Mm -hmm. You get case two, so you're even more survivable. Case also, not case two. (laughs) Yes. Case T-O-O. So it's kind of boring in the sense that it's the same AC5 and two medium lasers as the other Clint's with the 696 profile and 10 single heat sinks. But the fact you have a light auto cannon 5 and you've upgraded the armor to Pharaoh, it makes this almost a completely different mech. Mm-hmm. It's like when you uh, have a piece of chocolate and then you realize that it's got chili peppers in it or something. You're like, oh, oh, this is spicy. <laughs> or you realize it's white chocolate. <laughs> white chocolate isn't chocolate. Uh, There's no cocoa in it. It's not chocolate. <laughs> is it delicious? Yes. Is it chocolate? No. <laughs> Which is kind of my point. Is this a Clint? Maybe, but it's delicious. <laughs> I will agree that it's delicious. <laughs> so this guy's got a battle value of 901 and a point value of 24. We then come to the model that Josh alluded to by peeking forward ahead a little bit. We have the Clint 6S seen in 3069 as well. Busy year. It's got a movement profile of 711. So go in extra quick on this guy. It's got an ER small laser in the head, two ER medium lasers in the left torso, and two ER large lasers in the right arm. It has a light fusion engine, endo steel, and heavy ferro. It also has 12 double heat sinks. This guy is a little warm for my taste. He at least upgrades the armor. He's got about the same armor as the uh, the champion we talked about last week with 128 points of, of armor. Mm-hmm. It's it's kind of boring again. <laughs> um, I mean, it's this hot, also, but it's boring. <laughs> the, the thing that I approve of in this mech, though... Oh, wait, never mind. It's still got... Oh, yeah, it's got a light, light fusion. It optimizes the tonnage for the speed. Mm-hmm. So a 40-tonner moving 7.11 with a light fusion engine, you don't get more free tonnage than that. Um, so it's, it's a nicely optimized mech at this point, I guess, but so hot, so hot. Mm-hmm. It's so hot. And I kind of feel like it, with, with ER on everything, I kind of feel like it should have overheat long in Alpha Strike, but I guess ER mediums don't reach out quite that far. Yeah, I mean, they go to 12, but, you know, you can be firing both of those larges at 19, so... So this guy's got a battle value of thirteen thirty four and a point value of thirty seven. We then come oh, and to it's a Torian our... mech. Can't forget that. Oh, is it? I thought it would have been Steiner with the S. Oh no, it is. Which one was the Torian one? The three T. The, the one you uh, liked. 3T, the the lack. Oh, the three three T. It is. Yeah. Oh, of course. Of I, course, yeah. the one you liked is a Torian model. Hey, of course. I I just saw the light auto cannon. I assumed it was a Davian. <laughs> nah. I'm sure they've salvaged. Nah, the lobbies. 
probably gave it to him fluff wise is what it says so yeah it's tainted slightly but you know all right so for our last model today we have the clint 2c2 seen in 3073 this guy's got a movement profile of 698 it's got a ecm suite in the head it's got a medium pulse laser in the center torso a medium pulse laser in the left torso and three medium pulse lasers in the right arm. It's got ten double heat sinks and an XL engine and, of course, improved jump jets to get that movement profile. And it has Pharaoh for armor and endo steel for a skeleton. This thing is, uh, I heard you like pulse lasers. <laughs> and jumping fart. Like, <laughs> th- this is not a Clint. There's no auto cannon on it. Yeah. But there is no main gun. This is a really nice 40 tonner. This six, is a Clint eight. back. This is a Clint back. <laughs> uh, 698, that 8, I and mean, just jump. You're always jumping. Jump, jump, jump. Mm-hmm. And then you've got four clan medium pulse lasers. Whoo, that's going to hurt. And you're hiding behind an ECM suite? Five, actually. Five, yes. Two in the torso and three in the arm. Five. That's that's even that's even better. Yeah. And you've got enough. But wait, there's one more. <laughs> You've got enough double heat sinks to alpha them, although not. You'll just generate movement heat. Yeah, but you're you've got improved jump jets. So instead of generating eight heat when you jump, you're only generating four. Like, yeah, I can deal with that. I can deal yeah. with that. I mean, you could easily just drop one or two pulse lasers for a turn. You know, if you need to. Yeah, or I'd, if I were playing this, I would probably jump for like three or four turns and alpha every single turn because you'd be generating four heats so after three turns you'd be up to 12 and the nice thing about jump jets another reason they're kind of broken in classic is when you lose movement points due to heat it does not affect your jump jets mm-hmm. so you go three turns of jumping and alpha striking get up to 12 heat jump away for a turn cool off and then jump back in yep seems good and you're putting out 35 points of damage a turn at minus two. Clans are so dirty. <laughs> you sold there, yes. Well, you do pay for it in the battle value, which is 1890 and a point value of 34. But uh, this is definitely cool. This is definitely neat. And it seems like it would be a lot of fun to play with. Oh, it's got jump strong, too. So that means when in Alpha Strike, when you jump with it, you get a TMM of four. <laughs> Ooh, nice. Oh, man. Did something just get bookmarked? <laughs> uh, no, I don't have a, a Raven Alliance list, and it's not in plastic. Fair. All right, for our Mech Warrior profiles today, we're going to start off with Mech Warrior Janos Arthur Denton II. He was assigned to the Arcturian Guard of House Steiner. He's had his Clint for some time, and his family is well known throughout the Lyran Commonwealth. But no one knows how it came to possess a Clint, particularly one of these high-tech rarer ones from the original Star League. Janos has more than proved that he and the and the Clint are quite capable warriors during the battles of Alexandria against House Curita. To date, he's had little difficulty in getting repair parts for his mech, although his gyro has never been damaged in combat. And he is considered the urban combat specialist for his recon lance, which is kind of odd given that the AC-5 is traditionally a longer range weapon. Mm -hmm. Unless, of course, this is an AC-10 version. Well, I can partially answer that with our next mech warrior, mech warrior Janos Arthur Denton III. He uh, followed in his father's footsteps and joined the armed forces and eventually ended up in the unit of the 17th Arcturian Guard. Uh, He particularly enjoys fighting Karitan Panthers, and that is because they are nicely, nicely matched with the fact that he has replaced the autocannon with the large laser. So this is the the named variant we talked about earlier in the episode. And uh, just like his father, he is an expert in urban combat and scouting. And uh, many people have pressed as to how he and his family got the machine, but uh, they are apparently keeping that secret close to the chest. Lost heir of the Star League. <laughs> <laughs> Denton is actually an anagram for Cameron. <laughs> I don't think that's how anagrams work. <laughs> <laughs> Next up, we have Hotman Janos Arthur Denton V. Ah, we skipped a number. 
Hopman Denton was part of the 17th Arcturian Guards and was stationed on Small World with them just as the Jihad began in to break. Piloting the family Clint Jad, which is an acronym for Janus Arthur Denton. It had been upgraded to the 5U configuration at the time. Unfortunately, given the shattered state of the Arcturian Guards after the start of the Word of Lake Assault on the planet, uh, it is likely that Janos Arthur Denton V died on planet, and unfortunately, he was the last of the Denton line. So, there is no more Dentons. Although, supposedly, a Clint sporting Jad on its left forearm has been seen engaging Blakis as part of the Small World Resistance. So, yes, maybe there's it's a Jad the sixth. <laughs> Stanley Yelnats, the fourth... That, that is what that reminds me of. Next up, we have Lieutenant James Wallace. He's the commander of a heavy recon lance of House Liao's St. Ives Armored Cavalry. He inherited his mech from the family armaments upon the natural death of his father. This particular Clint has seen action dating back to the last days of the First Succession War and has recently been engaged in and around the planet Ward against House Davian. Wallace has lost the gyro on the Clint in combat, and it took him over three months to find a proper replacement. Since then, he has used some of his family's influence to gain a backup gyro. Good planning, good planning. Also, uh, props to his dad for being a stone-cold battle for dying of old age in the Battletech universe. <laughs> yeah, and there's no, yeah, like, very rare. Apparently there. <laughs> yeah, there's no asterisk. Apparently. <laughs> So next up, we have Lieutenant Stephen D. Allen. Lieutenant Allen was a member of the first Kittery Breachers before and during the Fourth Succession War. He captured his Clint from the St. Ives Armored Cavalry and was able to ransom the pilot back for spare parts, including a gyro, or replacement parts for the gyro. Stephen was a fierce mech warrior on the battlefield who organized his scout lance to operate in a devastating hit-and-run tactics off the battlefield, he was vocal in his philosophical beliefs in reducing the military in all of human space and for humanity to transition away from neo-feudalism. I am sure he ruffled some feathers, uh, but I think we can all agree on the merit of his ideas. Mm. I don't know. I kind of like a monarchy. Mm. I kind of don't. <laughs> <laughs> aren't, aren't you Canadian? Aren't you supposed to say God save the queen? I'm supposed to, but I don't. <laughs> <laughs> Finally, we have Mech Warrior Fletcher Raymond. He's currently assigned to the 5th Regiment Crucis Lancers House Davian. Back during the First Succession War, during the Battle for Bell, his great uncle happened to capture a Clint. This Clint still works well, except for one of the medium lasers, which does not work at all, due to the damage sustained during the Battle for Bell. Fletcher's performance during the battle for Tarusan on Seoul against House Kurita has earned both himself and his mech a great deal of respect. Not having your third medium laser on a Clint kind of hurts. That's a third of your firepower. Yeah. It's only a third, don't worry. So, for our data dive, I am going to throw over to Josh. Alright, today we're going to be talking about jump drives and interstellar travel, and tangentially fusion drives. The story of the jump drive, also known as a star drive or a Kearney Fujita drive, begins in 2018. So this happened three years ago, folks. Uh, dig around for some papers. If you can find it, we'd love to see what the actual uh, papers say. 2018, professors Thomas Kearney and Takeyosha Fujita of Stanford University noticed some anomalies in their prototype fusion reactor that could not be explained by then-known Einsteinian physics. Again, by then we mean 1998 or 1988 physics, mm -hmm. not actual 2018 physics. They would go on to publish a series of papers that would lay the foundation for the Kearney Fujita drive. These papers were what happened to the universe when Einstein wasn't looking, Einstein's theories, the cooked and the raw, now what, and finally pan dimensionality. Unfortunately for professors Kearney and Fujita, these papers cost them their jobs and their standing in the scientific community as most of their colleagues thought they were a pair of crackpots. 84 years later, these papers were rediscovered in 2102 and were taken seriously for a change. According to their theories, it was possible to wrap a, quote, hyperspatial field around an object possessing mass, which would cause the object to travel instantaneously to a distant location. Based on this research, the Terran Alliance built the TAS Pathfinder, 
to test the Kirni Fujita star drive, and on December 5th, 2108, it successfully jumped to the Tau SETI system. Its successful out-system jump was built on the successful in-system jumps by an unmanned probe in 2107 and astronaut Raymond Bache earlier in the year of 2108. So they'd actually made two successful KF drive jumps before the TAS Pathfinder went to Tau SETI. Mm-hmm. But they were unmanned. So Well, one was can't... unmanned, and then uh, the second one in-system jump, so maybe Nader to Zenith jump yeah. points, was, was a manned jump. And, I mean, uh, also, point of note, uh, that jump is uh, part of the cinematic for uh, HBS's Battletech, which mm-hmm. is... Uh, just a top-notch intro to a game and universe. Yeah, it was it was pretty sweet. Yes, it is pretty sweet. Uh, if you've if you played the HBS BattleTech game, you've probably seen a lot of what I'm going to be describing in today's data dive. Given how much time you spend traveling from planet to planet in that game, so Kirni Fujita drives apparently cannot be made smaller or to mass mass less than seventy five thousand tons. That's such a big number that I had to find a point of reference. And the closest I found was the Yamato-class battleship, which displaced 73,000 metric tons. So your smallest KF drive mass is is about the same as a Yamato. (laughs) That big. That big. Yeah. Now, it's probably not the same size, given it's solid, Mm -hmm. but we'll get into that. Uh, On the upper end of size for a KF drive, so far the biggest they've gotten is about... 350,000 tons of mass. And those are in some of the largest warships like the Potemkin. The core of a Kearney Fujita star drive is a titanium germanium, 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 is a titanium germanium alloy rod, dozens, often hundreds of meters long. This rod is suspended in a sleeve filled with liquid helium, which is there to supercool the titanium germanium core down to the point where it becomes a superconductor. At the aft end of this superconductor is what Battletech literature describes as field initiator machinery, which is what actually generates the hyperspatial field, and then the titanium germanium superconductor amplifies that field to create the the full-scale field that will move the ship and everything attached to the ship. Creating that bubble. Yep. Further aft is the power conversion and storage systems which convert and stores the power generated by the solar collection system, also known as the jump sails. Jump sails are, as it sounds, are essentially giant solar panel fabrics that the ship unfurls a half kilometer or so behind the vessel. Uh, They have to be a half kilometer or further away to ensure that the gigantic fusion drives that hold the... uh, the jump ship away from the star don't burn away your solar panel fabric Mm -hmm. and these jump sails are colossal i mean we're kilometers wide at a minimum (laughs) yeah i mean we're talking you can you can look up art and they're half a kilometer behind the ship and that's about the distance for one half or, or one segment segment of this donut shaped solar sail. So yeah, well over a kilometer in diameter. I did pluralize it. <laughs> yeah. Modern jump ships, station keeping drives, don't develop more than 0.2 g's of thrust, and primarily act to keep the jump ship from falling quotes closer to the sun and getting stuck in its gravity well. However, they are strong enough to allow for limited mobility to navigate star systems which is a good thing to remember when you're reading some of these novels where jump ships will appear at non-standard locations or they'll move Pirate out points. of the way of retaliation and they're not immobile. Mm-hmm. Point two well, g I mean, of acceleration is decently fast in terrestrial terms. Yes. And, you know, you have to clear those jump points because, you know, if you have a very busy system, you can't just be hanging out in the in and out ramp all the time. Yep. <laughs> What? Yeah, you can. Come on. Older jump ships, though, uh, had much larger fusion engines. Uh, The most famous of this type is the Aquila class, which has been occasionally seen since then, although they are very rare, and no other jump ships uh, of this style are known to exist anymore. And the reason these older first-generation jump ships had much larger fusion engines than modern ones 
is they were used to not just jump from system to system, but they actually made the transit from jump point to planet, and they lacked jump sails. So they would charge their jump engines off of their fusion reactors while they were transiting from jump, jump point to planet. However, as jump drive technology was refined and the crew, the cores grew larger and more capable, engineers and material scientists would develop a compact Kearney Fujita core. However, these were astronomically expensive, even more astronomically astronomically expensive than the already astronomically expensive fusion drives or jump drives. So we're not really suited for civilian or commercial use and would remain relegated to the realm of national militaries and warships. So given the cost of the compact KF Corps, ship designers would begin exploring more cost-effective designs for the civilian market. Now the, the jump ships were using an insane amount of hydrogen because they were using it to fuel their fusion engines, which means they were throwing a load of hydrogen out the back of the ship, and they were also using them for their fusion reactors to charge the jump drives and everything else on the ship. Mm-hmm. So in order to... Re- so, that, Go ahead. so that tank would get uh, pretty empty pretty quick. Yeah, and you had to have a lot of it in order to move from the, the jump point around the star to the planet you were going to. So that was, even though hydrogen is the most plentiful element in the galaxy, this was still a major cost in operating jump ships. And as I mentioned, the size needed to hold all this hydrogen made these ships larger and more complex. Well, and on top of that, they didn't have drop ships yet. They were using single stage surface to orbit shuttles to transfer all of the cargo and personnel on the ship. And since you didn't know necessarily know what kind of infrastructure the planet you were going to had, you had to be able to carry your own SSO orbital shuttles Mm -hmm. to your destination, which took up even more room and made it even more complex. Because now you have to have internal hangars to transfer cargo and doors to keep the atmosphere in those cargo bays and hangar bays and just... I'm just kind of picturing like the 40k uh, design aesthetic where it's just like everything's built on top of each other, you know? Yeah, and everything's done by guys manually hauling on chains. Yeah. Yep. So That's how it's done, right? <laughs> so as these engineers and designers were looking for ways to make jump ships more affordable and efficient, they developed the Kearney Fuchida boom, which would extend out from a jump ship to a parasite vessel and encase that vessel in the jump field as well, which would allow it to jump with the jump ship. And they also developed docking collars that were highly adaptable and could be fitted to most orbital shuttles in existence. And all of this takes place sometime during the 25th century. It's not 100% clear when some of those advances took place. We have a window. <laughs> yeah, I think the I think the boom in one of the um, in one of the sources, the boom was developed in the year 2400, so the very first year of the 25th century. Mm-hmm. I had not heard of the boon before. That's uh, that's an interesting bit of tech. <laughs> yeah, it shows up in some of the older novels uh, when they describe docking sequences. And if you read the old, um, or if you ever read the old uh, Jump Ships and Drop Ships aerospace book, mm-hmm. it's kind of like a TRO slash supplement for Jump Ships and Drop Ships. That it mentions it there. Okay, cool. Yeah, I, I have not read that one, but I do have it uh, in my digital collection. So with the KF boom and the docking collars, engineers started to build smaller, slimmer jump ships that relied on the single-stage surface-to-orbit shuttles to dock directly with the exterior of the ship and use the boom to travel with the ship, eliminating the need for large internal cargo bays. And then somebody realized we could make these SSO shuttles even bigger so that they can make the trip from the jump point to the planet itself and eliminate the need for those large interplanetary fusion drives on the jump ships. Mm -hmm. And so by the end of the 25th century, the current format had largely been defined and has remained the same for the past seven centuries. Jump ships that are a little more than a Kearney Fujita drive core, station keeping engine, solar or jump sails, and command and control living quarters for its crew. And then jump ship or drop ships that 
mate to the outside of the jump ship to be carried. And then the drop ships themselves hold all the cargo, all the passengers, and do all the work to transit from the jump point to the planet. Mm -hmm. Uh, The other reason these shuttles exist in the first place was these older jump ships were far too large to enter a planetary atmosphere. So you had to have some way to get to and from the planet surface. And this just streamlines the whole process. Ironically, by turning it into two ships instead of one. Mm -hmm. But two very specialist ships. Absolutely. And it was, we all know, specialization makes economies more efficient. Mm -hmm. So part of the reason that we're doing this data dive is we've been asked to describe how travel in the Battletech universe happens. And whether it's cargo you're transporting or passengers, interstellar travel follows the same pattern. Dropships are loaded on the ground, usually at a drop port, and then lift off under several Gs of acceleration to achieve orbit. Dropships are divided into two classes. Spheroid dropships lift off like traditional rockets. The engines are on the bottom of the ship. It goes straight up, comes straight back down. If you've been watching Elon Musk's SpaceX rocket landings, it's like that, generally with less explosions. (laughs) Because of the spheroid, dropships are very simple and sturdy and see widespread use and can land almost anywhere. You don't actually need a built-up landing field for a spheroid you just need somewhere flat that's large enough for the ship to land and it and and is solid and is solid like not a swamp <laughs> well well we've actually seen them land in swamps in some of the gray death legion books so it's true and we've also seen them converted into nuclear powered steamships in the gray death legion books so your mileage may vary yeah, Grey Death gets up to a lot of wacky stuff with tech sometimes. Yes, they do. Very early days of Battletech. Gotta love it. Yeah. <laughs> the main drawback to spheroids is that they are fairly unmaneuverable in the atmosphere as they ride on that column of fusion fire and can't really maneuver. The other type, aerodynes... Who would have thought? Aerodynes do fly like aircraft and gain at least some lift from forward velocity, which makes them far more agile in the atmosphere, which is why most... Um, Assault dropships are aerodynes because they can kind of sort of dogfight in the atmosphere and make strafing runs more efficiently. They are less of a fi- of a flying brick. Yes. <laughs> less. Not not. And an example of one of those that many people might have seen is a leopard. Yes. Leopard is the prototypical aerodyne for the Battletech universe. You see it in MechWarrior Online. It's what drops you off. You see it in HBS. It's what drops you off. You see it in MechWarrior 5. Same with 5. It's what yep. drops you off. <laughs> The issue with aerodynes is they are far more complex than spheroids because they don't just need one set of fusion drives. They need two because their primary drives are at the aft end of the ship, but then they have to have lifters on the ventral surface for any sort of short takeoff and landing or vertical takeoff and landing. Mm -hmm. And then on top of that, you have to transit or you have to reconfigure the interior space when you go into interstellar travel because when you are in atmosphere you're being pulled down by gravity towards the ventral side of the ship but when you're out there in inter- interplanetary space driving towards your destination you're under pseudo gravity from the acceleration from the primary engines behind you which means everything inside the ship has a gravity that's shifted 90 degrees from when you're operating in planetary atmosphere. Yep. Hope those mech clamps are good. Well, that's an interesting thing I just thought of. I get, I, I just came to me. It was not part of my notes. This makes working on battle mechs very interesting in a aerodyne. Yeah. Because if you set it up right, it is that mech is now either, air quotes, on its face or on its back. Or on its side. Or on its side. Which means you might be able to get to stuff more easily because mm-hmm. everything's now at ground level instead of... 13 meters up in the air now like it's probably completely impractical but like how cool would it be if like just every single room just shifted 90 degrees <laughs> <laughs> i mean i it's in some of the books they've described having to reconfigure like sleeping compartments and stuff yeah and we I mean, it, it totally it totally makes sense and like i hadn't thought about it until you brought it up but like no all of that tracks yeah and, i mean theoretically especially if you're doing this for hundreds of years you could probably find clever ways to make it happen quickly and efficiently, like fold out beds. It folds out yeah. on one end for one type, and then it folds out on the side for the other type of gravity and 
keep or it simple. Theoretically, uh, you could basically have a false wall that everything is built onto that's like got uh, like a rail system or whatever, and you just like shift it 90 degrees, you know, like so that entire wall shifts. Yeah. And everything's attached to that. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it'd be interesting to see all the different varieties of reconfiguration you have on Aerodynes, especially on like the Monarch is a cruise ship style Aerodyne drop ship. So you got a lot of rich people on there and a lot of middle class passengers as well. So, you know, how did the, did the middle class have to kind of manually reconfigure and the rich people just push a button and the whole room like rotates? Like, be interesting to see how it works. And I'm guessing the uh, the really low rent ones, just everybody has a hammock, <laughs> which is the simplest. <laughs> <laughs> so once you've boarded your drop ship, you've taken off under several G's, uh, which is often done while you're asleep. They'll give you a sleeping pill right before takeoff, so you can sleep through all the extra G's. And you're out in space, accelerating under one G for the first half of your your trip, accelerating toward under one G towards the jump point. You'll experience a brief moment of zero g or microgravity when the ship, when the dropship reaches its midpoint and does what's called a turnover, where it will flip end for end and then start accelerating away from the jump point. And they do this because you you already have so much momentum traveling in that direction, you have to slow it down in order to make docking speeds once you reach the jump ship. And to do that, you accelerate the opposite direction. Also known as decelerating. Yes. Technically, you know, like according to physics and all that. Well, yes, we, we consider it decelerating, but it, phys- according to physics, it's accelerating in the opposite direction. And it's important to make that distinction, I think, because it's that acceleration in the opposite direction, which continues to give you that sense of gravity for the second half of your trip. Yep. And remember, in space, momentum is a thing, and there is very little friction in space. Mm -hmm. Military ships will sometimes travel in at 2G or higher in order to cut down transit times, but this is very rarely, if ever, done on civilian dropships. Once you reach the jump point, your dropship will dock at one of the docking collars of the jump ship. The KF boom will be extended, and you'll be ready for the jump. However, jump ships can take a week or more to charge their jump drive off of those jump sails, which means if you got there shortly after the jump ship arrived, you could be floating for a week or more. And if you are going to be making multiple jumps with the same jump ship, you could be experiencing microgravity for several weeks in a row while you wait for the jump ship to recharge its drive at each point. Because of this, a lot of jump ships will have what they call gravity decks, which are basically giant uh, decks that spin or rotate around the jump ship's centerline. Mm -hmm. This causes centripetal force to be exerted on anybody and anything in those spinning sections, which is felt as centrifugal force and a sort of pseudo-gravity for people who enter it. And this allows jump ship crews and the occasional drop ship visitors to experience gravity on a regular basis because long-term exposure to microgravity can do bad things to your muscles and bones. Yep. Didn't need those bones anyway. <laughs> An example you could see in pop culture is like uh, 2001, you know, just the, the big donut that is rotating around on the station. Yeah, it's a great example. Mm-hmm. So once your jump ship has arrived at the destination, and again, it can take a while because it's a week or more to recharge for, for most jumps, and the jump ship can only make 30 light years in a single jump and it has to land at a star so it can recharge its jump drive. Mm-hmm. Once you reach the de- the jump ship reaches your destination, your jump ship or your drop ship will disconnect and start the process in reverse where it's now accelerating towards the planet at 1g, reach that midpoint weightlessness as you flip over and then start decelerating or accelerating in the opposite direction. And given the fact that you have to accelerate there and back at 1G, you have multiple days or weeks to recharge the jump drive, multiple jumps. Travel in Battletech is measured in months in most cases. Yep. Which is really cool for the setting because it allows plots and campaigns to kind of extend out over a large period of time. And it's one mm-hmm. of the reasons for the feudal system that we talked about earlier because you can't just 
have your parliament show up and do things within a day or so. They, they're coming from all across your giant space nation. Could take them months, so you have people regionally who can make those decisions for the military mm-hmm. and foreign policy. Yeah. I mean, arguably, you could get away with it if you had, like, instantaneous uh, communication, but it would still be very, very difficult. <laughs> yep. And you would need secure instantaneous communication without some giant mega corporation listening to everything your parliamentarians or other government officials say and do. Mm-hmm. Nothing can go wrong with that. Comstar. <laughs> now, if speed is absolutely necessary, command circuits can be established to increase this travel speed by cutting out the need to wait for jump ships to recharge. This is done by having a jump ship waiting at the next system and then transiting your drop ship from the jump ship you arrived on to the new jump ship, which will then jump to the next system on your route. And you can repeat this <laughs> as many times as you have jump ships pre-positioned, which is key because you have to have the jump ships pre-positioned. You can't necessarily do it on the fly. I heard you like logistics. Yes. It, <laughs> Battletech is a fun game for logistics or a fun setting. It really is. Command circuits are most common in military operations to allow one side's forces an advantage as they can, with a command circuit, they can more easily get inside their opponent's OODA loop, since you can suddenly transit stuff in a matter of days instead of weeks or months. It's, it's not talked about for civilian travel so much, if at all, but I would expect that given the nature of interstellar travel and logistics... It's probably fairly common to have jump ships running on a route that Mm -hmm. makes up a pseudo command circuit. You may not have a jump ship waiting for you when you arrive, but it probably won't be more than a couple of days before. Well, so that was touched ever so briefly in the Draconis Combine source book where during the early days of the founding, uh, who they were fighting was a merchant clan that basically had their own little fiefdoms and would do that, you know, had their circuits and all of that. And given logistics of food distribution, because we do literally have breadbasket planets and, you know, cash crops are a thing, I imagine many transport companies would have, if not command circuits set up a, you know, like distribution setup that is like that you know like this one takes two jumps and then then it passes off to this ship that takes three or something like that and they're all going in like a big loop yeah or you arrive in system and there's a jump ship there and it's not all the way charged up but it's been charging for three or four days and so it halves the amount of time you have to wait to move on to the next one and then the one you were on will make the, the the jump a week later on its schedule and you can just have you know, four or five Mm -hmm. jump ships traveling this big circuit, and each one is three or four days ahead of the one behind it. And as they catch up to each other, they pass on stuff to the next location and and move things more. Not full command circuit, because you're not having a fully charged jump ship waiting. Yes. But a pseudo one that speeds up your your economy. We'll we'll call it a civilian circuit. How about that? Civilian circuit. I like that. Um, the other way to speed up your travel time is to have a fancy high-tech lithium fusion battery, which basically through the magic of space wizards allows you to carry enough jump charge for two jumps. Yeah, like I just kind of contextualized it in my brain as, oh, the gas tank they are filling for the drive, they have two of those. <laughs> yeah, and it's it's interesting because... The lore around jump drives, the jump drive itself isn't the particularly delicate part because you have to dump all of that energy really quickly in order to jump. It's the charging mechanism and the batteries themselves that are quite delicate. So you can't fast charge them. Um, I'm not sure how much sense that makes, but it is Uh, what it is. To be fair, yeah, like I actually kind of really like that because you can have a narrative effect of like and i worked with a guy who would make fun of this term incessantly but and i get it because it's fair but hot load the jump drive you know that's when you're dumping energy into it faster than you're supposed to and then you 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 do that because you narratively need to get to the next jump point quicker to outrun somebody and it 
it allows you to have that narrative tension uh also like we have slow methodical movement and so like because we're only jumping 30 light years at a time uh, you could still if you can recharge in five hours you're still going to be able to go quite far quite quickly and i like the idea of it being not the engine but the battery because normally it's the other way around like it's a little bit of an inversion yeah and really it's less of a battery and more of a capacitor is the, in the yeah. way it works which is why i i think that's why the the lithium fusion battery kind of bugs me because it's not really going to be a battery it's just a second capacitor because you can't have the if if the capacitor needs to be charged slowly just having a giant battery to then rapidly charge the capacitor doesn't fix the problem so that you literally have a second capacitor is what you have to have that switches onto the circuit but that's a little deeper into jump drive lore than i had planned on going so we'll move on (laughs) <laughs> the last bit you have to understand for interstellar travel is it's not anything like travel as most people experience it today because you're not just hopping on an airplane to the next city over. It's much has much more in common with uh, oceanic travel in the early 1900s up until the 1950s really when they started getting transcontinental aircraft. You mm-hmm. have a stateroom. The The more wealthy you are, the bigger and fancier it is. For most people, it's probably going to be like staying in a extra small generic hotel room where the hotel travels to your destination. Yeah, that, that is a good descriptor. Now, the most elite and expensive of the tran- uh, you know, luxury trans- drop- transport dropships do occasionally have some fairly cool amenities, such as the Princess-class dropship, which has an indoor Olympic-sized swimming pool that you can go swimming in (laughs) as long as the ship's accelerating under 1G. Anytime you're experiencing weightlessness, they shut down the swimming pool deck and they close up the the pool so the water doesn't escape. (laughs) Just put a tarp over it? Escape. (laughs) Yep. Fun fact, the Princess is a design that was created and produced, and is still produced... In the Magistrasi of Canopus, that backwards periphery, and they make the most yeah. coolest drop things. <laughs> so most normal worlds, you can experience, you can expect an experience like staying in a a, a smaller hotel room because they have to fit all of these all of these rooms onto a much smaller space. However, if you are traveling out into the periphery or beyond the periphery where there's fewer ships, it's much more likely you'll experience something like maybe a a space hostel or even catching a ride on a tramp freighter like people would occasionally do in the past one before aircraft sped up travel significantly i mean you can apparently still do that you can still book like your trip on freighters going across oceans it's just you know you're going to be there forever (laughs) yeah and it's not going to be private stateroom no you might have to help out with stuff on the ship yep you're eating what they're eating. <laughs> yep. And that's that's kind of what you can expect when you're out in the periphery or even uh, underserved areas in larger nation states. And that uh, that wraps up today's data dive on jump ships, drop ships, and interstellar travel. Well, thank you for that uh, extensive uh, data dive. That was uh, fantastic and informative. I try. <laughs> but you never told us how high they jump. <laughs> That, that reference escapes me. It's not a reference, it's just a joke because they're jump ships. He's making a bad joke. <laughs> so our sources for today are <laughs> Sarna, Battletech Battle Mech Manual, Master Unit List, TRO Succession Wars, Record Sheet Succession Wars, TRO 3050 Upgrades, Record Sheets 3050 Inner Sphere. TRO 3025. This podcast is made possible by our supporters on patreon.com backslash on the origin of battle mechs link in the description. Our social media on Twitter is at origin of mechs. We also have a community discord, the armory of Ouroboros link in the description. You can email us at on the origin of battle mechs at gmail.com. If you enjoy the show, please leave a review on your platform of consumption. Tell your friends about us and share on your community platform of choice. Special thanks to my friend Laura for the intro and outro. Our ace pilot Patreons are currently John Keith III. Class dismissed. Everybody have a great day. Peace out, mech warriors.
Stay safe out there. Module complete. System standby. Would you like to load the next module? They... I apparently dropped off writing at some point, because I just have... They then produced blank. He was piloting the family, Clint uh, Jad, which is also a... Uh, oh, what is that? It stands for Janus Arthur Denton. What's the word? Uh, guys, help me. I'm looking for the word. When you use the first letter. Oh, okay. I, I see how it is. I understand.